So this plan kind of for Tim and I the next uh, 45 minutes, an hour or so, we're going to first off try and expose you kind of to the mainstream uh, cattle marketing uh, from the feedlot perspective. So we'll talk about live, uh, live weight pricing, grid pricing, carcass pricing, and talk a bit about custom feeding. Tim's going to then talk more about kind of the smaller scale freezer beef, direct sales off the farm kind of stuff, and then talk about some Kentucky Park a bag program and so forth. Stop us with questions anytime. Tim, feel free to interject as I'm talking. Anything you think of, keep me on track. Um, in general, if I was just going to try and describe the cattle finishing industry to you, I would describe it this way. I would say, first of all, it's typically a fairly, fairly high risk, high reward industry, and it is. You tend to see multiple good months, multiple bad months. Bad months tend to be fairly cyclical. Um, while we don't have very much cattle finished in Kentucky, we finished. If you, if you buy USDA numbers, we finish about two. Generally, what I tend to see, cattle that come off feed and are slaughtered sometime in the spring of the year tend to do better than those in the fall for a couple of reasons. One, cattle that are placed on feed in the fall typically place on a fairly fairly weaker market, and then your spring market tends to be higher in terms of fed cattle price. Um, the other thing I always make a point at is that while we oftentimes think about feedlots as, as businesses who, who buy feeder cattle, finish them themselves and sell finished cattle. The honest truth, a lot of them do so on a custom basis. So you've got a lot of feeders out there who really specialize in not feeding cattle they own, but essentially feeding cattle for other people to own a fee basis. And we'll talk about that some. So when we talk about custom feeding, the way I describe it is, this is a situation where the feedlots that are actually managing and feeding the cattle do not own or at least don't own them all. So the owner of the cattle is the person who actually owns those, and they're the ones. They're the ones who are going to incur feed, vet, medicine, health costs, things like that. Feed yards who finish cattle on a custom basis typically make their money in one of two ways. The most common way is they charge what's called yardage. Okay, and this is a fee that's used to cover their facilities, their time, their labor, kind of their maintenance. <coughs> You can almost think of it like room and board. The other way that it gets done sometimes, and this is less common, is they don't charge yardage. Instead, what they do is they charge a, a, a feed cost that's somewhat marked up. So either way, they're going to recoup the cost of their facilities and their time and management. Now, with the things that we talk about, I, I kind of pose this question to you. Why do you suppose people like me who talk to groups about cattle economics will oftentimes say that that feed yard returns will look very bad for a very long time. For example, the last, so about six weeks ago, feed yards were probably losing about $500 per head on the cattle they were selling. Right now, it's probably $300 or so. So why would we see an industry like the feedlot sector have those really long periods of, uh, periods of losses that are so deep? Why would that happen? Any thoughts? So here's a couple. Okay, the first thing I would say is this right here. Okay, in a lot of cases, it's not the actual cattle finisher that's incurring those losses, right? If they own those cattle, sure. If they're collecting yards, they're not actually incurring those losses. That's number one. Okay, the other thing that's important to think about is when, when people say something like that, what they're really doing is there's an, all right, cattle that are coming off feed right now in November, okay? We're probably placed on feed sometime back in the you know late spring, early summertime, and they look at what were paid for those feeder cattle back then, look at what they are selling for right now, and then they'll estimate a, a profit or a loss. Okay? What might some feed yards do back in the spring or early summer when they place those feeder cattle? Hedge their they might hedge or they might contract, exactly. Okay? So they may not fully feel the brunt of this market drop if they did that. Okay? Many of those folks have got contracts with um, uh, uh, with uh, processors and retailers long term. We may not feel that so much. It could go either way, though. Say it again. It could go either way, though, for a, somebody that contracts that far out. Price could go up. Price could go up, and they won't make as much, right? But they might prevent themselves from having a loss. Mm -hmm. Sure, sure. Good thought. In terms of cost for finishing, 
the first and the biggest is, is the placement cost of the feeders. Okay, that's the biggest expense that they've got going in. From there, it's feed, mineral, health, vet medicine, labor, overhead, death loss, transportation, injuries, and sometimes yardage if it applies. Okay, these are costs that are typically incurred. Now, I'm not going to go into a lot of details on the numbers as much as you understand the concept that there is there is a lot of cost to doing this. The other thing to remember is there is a significant time lag. Okay, cattle that are placed on feed today, depending on what they weigh and how they're fed, are going to be on feed probably something close to six months. Okay, so there's a pretty significant time lag between when cattle are placed and when they come off feed is another challenge. In general, there are three primary ways that fed cattle, finished cattle are marketed. Okay, the first is live weight pricing where price is simply agreed upon based on what the live weight of the animals are. So Kevin shared with us some, some estimated live weights for these cattle. Okay? Price is just simply multiplied by live weight. Another way that it's done is carcass weight basis or dressing basis. Also that way, very similar, but instead of that price being based on the live weight, it's based on the number of pounds on the carcass. Talk about that adjustment. The third one I'll talk about more today is, is group basis. Okay? And, and this is the idea that we're going to agree on a base price, and then we're going to assign premiums and discounts based on how well those animals do. So when, when Dare walked through, when Dare walked through earlier with you, okay, quality grading and yield grading, with a grid pricing structure, we're going to agree on a base price, then we're going to adjust that price upward or downward based on how well they how well they actually grade. And we'll walk through some examples of that. Right. Is that what people refer to as a slide or is that something? It's, it's different. Typically slide is something we use for feeder cattle to adjust price based on weight. Okay, so if, if, if cattle come in way more than expected, we might adjust the price downward. It's similar in that if cattle grade better or worse, we might adjust the price up or down, but slide typically applies to weight difference. Yeah, good question, Carol. Anything else? So think about it for a second. The basic feed yard marketing process, you know, a, a, a large feed yard has a lot of cattle on feed, okay? They may have several pens that are ready at any given time, okay? Typically, the, the packers will send a buyer out to look at those cattle, and, and they'll walk through those pens or, or walk around and look, and you understand in their mind what they're doing, they're trying to visually assess what we're going to do in a little bit, right? Well, are they going to tend to be choice select? What's the average weight? Do I think they'll yield well? When they do that, are they going to be 100% accurate? Definitely not. Okay? So if you are in that situation, if you're buying fed cattle for a company like Tyson, all right, what are you going to tend to do when you bid on those cattle since you know you're not going to be exactly right when you visually assess them? What would you do? And when we're not sure, what do we tend to do? Very has to assume average. They could assume average, but I'm almost going to go one step further. If, if you're not sure, you, you don't want your boss to be mad at you, what are you going to tend to do? You're going to tend to underbid a little bit, right? Exactly. Okay? And that is what tends to happen. Okay? So they're making their visually their visual as best as they can, but especially if they don't have any data to go on, any history of these type of cattle, they're probably going to err on the side of giving themselves some room to be a little bit wrong. Okay? But that's the process. And, and that's one reason why grid pricing sometimes is more efficient is you take out that uncertainty. All right? Um, so live pricing is very simple. All right? Whatever that live weight is and multiplied by price, that's your revenue. Okay? It, it, it's the simplest form by far. Um, carcass weight, very similar. What's the only thing that's going to impact the revenue if cattle are sold on a carcass basis. We know what price is, right? We know what live weight is. So all that's going to affect revenue is what? Ability. Dressing percentage, exactly. Okay? So if, simple math here, okay? Numbers are way off. If I can use simple math though and assume that live animal weight's a thousand pounds. Okay? And instead I agree on a carcass price. All right? if, those steers, if those steers dress 63%, I've got how many pounds of carcass? 630. 
Okay, if they grade 61 percent, I've got 610, right? Okay, the higher they grade, the more I'm going to multiply by that price number. Okay, these two are fairly straightforward. Um, Darren mentioned this already. When I think about dressing percentage, I typically think in terms of roughly 60 to 64 percent. This varies a lot. All right, sir. Okay. Um, so you know, so right now, live weights are somewhere kind of in this 1350 to 1400 pound range. If I've got a live weight of around 1350 pounds, and if that steer dress is 841, I can take 841 pound carcass, divide it by 1350 my live weight. That's a 62.3 percent dressing percentage. Similarly, if I'm trying to price cattle, and if live steers are selling for 135. Okay. How would I go about deciding, well, what's a comparable carcass price? Well, I just simply take that 135 and divide it by 62%. Here's a couple examples. Okay, Let's use that. Let's say that live cattle right now are selling for 135 a hundred weight, $1.35 a pound. This isn't too far off. Okay, If I'm negotiating with a buyer and he or she wants to buy my cattle based on a carcass basis, you understand the carcass is going to have fewer pounds in the live, right? So I've got to have a higher price. The question is how much higher? If the live weight price I want is 135 and I expect my cattle to dress 62%, I can take that 135, I can divide it by 0.62 or 62%. The carcass price equivalent is 217.74. Does that make sense what I just did? Okay, so in other words, Back to that thousand pound simple carcass for a second. All right. If I take a thousand pounds times 135, and my 62% dress is right, that's the same thing mathematically as 620 pounds times 217.74. Okay. So these are equivalent if my 62% dress is accurate. Does that make sense? And you can see how I'm better off if they grade 63 or 64%. Right. Any questions on that? Similarly, I've got a carcass price of, let's say, 225, and I want to convert that to a live equivalent. I do, I do the opposite. I, I take that 225, I multiply it by 0.62 instead of divide. The live equivalent is 139.50. Okay, so we can go back and forth between live weight pricing and carcass pricing simply by using that dressing percentage. Any questions? All right. Now, grid pricing is more complex, but it's much more interesting to think about, right? So as we talked about with grid pricing, we agree on some sort of base price based on the mainstream market, okay? And then we assign, we assign premiums and discounts based on how they actually do on the grid. So my, my grid revenue, instead of using live weight and carcass weight, or sorry, instead of using live weight, I'm gonna use carcass weight, but my grid price is not going to be determined until when? until I pull the hide off on those cattle are graded. Okay, so this is gonna take the uncertainty out for sure because buyers cannot see underneath the skin how good those are. Um, so really, to put it simply, there, there are three things that determine what cattle are gonna bring when sold on the grid. The first one we've talked about already, hot carcass weight, okay? That's the big one, that's the big one. There are discounts for carcasses that are too big and too small on most grids, most grids, all right? The other two are what Dare talked about, quality grades and yield grades. I won't talk a lot about those. I'll just simply kind of state what they are again. When we talk about quality grades that apply to, to young cattle, they're going to fall into four categories. Prime, choice, select, standard. What's the most desirable? The most desirable is prime. Standard's the least desirable of those. Okay. And again, how do we truly measure quality grade in the packing house? How does USDA graders, how do they measure quality grade? There's really one thing they measure and look at, right? One main one anyway. Modeling, right? The amount of intramuscular fat within the muscle tissue. That's how we measure quality. Okay? So prime carcasses simply have more marble. If quality measures quality, just remember that yield grades try to measure quantity. Quality measures how tries to measure how good the meat's going to be. Yield grades tried to measure how much retail meat is going to be there through harvest. 
the lower numbers are more desirable. Okay, a yield grade one simply means I expect more retail cuts than a yield grade five. I want to show you something real quick if I can get online here if this link works. But something I use to put this together today is a report that USDA puts out every every month. Sorry, every week. And that's fairly, fairly readable actually. So this is this is their weekly. Sorry, I'm moving around so much to it. Sorry. Um, this this is their weekly weekly summary of carcass premiums and discounts, and I use this fairly regularly. This gives us an idea of kind of what the mainstream cattle market is, is rewarding and discounting in terms of quality. Okay? So for example, notice here simple average, a choice carcass gets no premium or discount. That makes sense, right? We call that the base of the breed. Okay? What premium does a prime carcass get? On average, twelve dollars and eighteen cents per hundred weight. Did you hear me? Per hundred pounds. Okay. I, I said ballpark. Ballpark average slaughter weight right now was what? Thirteen fifty. Okay. So so ballpark carcass weight now is about eight fifty or so. So I'm talking about a prime carcass would get twelve dollar premium times about eight eight and a half right now. I'm talking about a hundred bucks. Okay, does that make sense? Significant. Select is right here. Okay, parentheses means negative. Select purposes right now are taking on average about a seven and a half dollar per hundred weight discount. Okay, that's the discount for not grading choice. And again, you're multiplying that seven forty five by eight eight and a half. Okay. Um, Darren mentioned yield rates too. So here's my yield grade three, kind of the base. All right, no premium, no discount. <coughs> yield grade one right now getting almost a four dollar premium. Yield grade two right at four. Okay. Here's a yield grade four, not expected to uh, yield near as well. <coughs> Eleven or twelve dollar discount. Okay. Does this make sense? What I'm showing you? We okay? I'm going to go back now to my presentation. I'm going to walk you through. A couple examples. The reason that we call it a grid is because we can lay it out in two dimensions like this. Now, I have rounded these to make them a bit easier to follow. Okay, so let's start real quick. So, the base price on this grid is two hundred twenty dollars per hundred weight. All right. But this is simply something I put together based on what I just showed you. Okay. So. What grade animal is going to sell for exactly 220 per hundred weight carcass? Who said choice? You're right. Good. Choice is right. And what you agree? Three. There you go. Okay. So a choice yield grade three is right here. You see it? Okay. No premium, no discount. That's the base of the grid. A choice yield grade three is going to sell for 220 per hundred weight carcass basis. Does that make sense? Okay. Now I did some rounding here. Okay. What's the premium for prime on this grid that I put together as an example? If this is my base for choice yield grade three, and all I change is my quality grade is prime, how much premium do I get? <coughs> This is a choice yield grade three. Do you see that? This is a prime yield grade three. Okay. So prime gets prime gets a twelve dollar per hundred weight premium. What's the discount for select on this grid? Get the exact same way. What is it? Right here, the set. Okay. This is choice, you'll break three. This is select, you'll break three. Any questions on what I'm doing? Does this make sense? Are you sure? I tell folks not to shake them, so thanks for not. Yeah, yeah, please. They have a whole group of, of feeder cattle, so they, they do every single head like this? They would, yeah. And they do averages. That they would grade them individually, okay, at the plant level. Okay? Now, the way that's done is fairly quick, right? Right. Okay? 
yield grade, quality grade boom, and then most plants have a quality control person who will go back through and say, I think you missed this one, missed this one, I want you to regrade these for me. So the initial assessment's very quick, but most plants have someone who go back and look and, and, and they can ask for a regrade at, time, at, at times. Yeah. These are finished cattle too, remember, right? Fed cattle, right? Okay, they're dead at this point. They're finished cattle. Okay. Let's do one more. This is a choice yield grade three, all right? What's the discount for a yield grade four on this group? Do you see it? Here's my choice yield grade three. If he, if he grades four, what's his discount? It's 11, exactly. Okay. Any questions? All right. So, if I have a prime yield grade three, okay, and my base price is 220, that prime yield grade three is actually going to sell for 232 on a carcass weight basis. Do you understand where the 232 comes from? That's the 220, and I'm adding what? I'm adding this $12 premium, right? Okay. So if my if my lot weight was 1350 and my first weight was was 837, I say 837 multiplied by 232 per pound, 232 per, per hundred weight, two dollars 32 cents per pound. Revenue is 1942 bucks. Similarly, if I had one that didn't do as well, if I had a select yield grade four, okay, I'm right here. It's an 18 dollar discount. My 220 becomes a 202. I take the 202 times the 837. Revenue is a little under $1,700. Okay? It's very common. We used to track a lot of cattle for carbon data earlier in my, very early in my career before I went gray. Remember those days? I, I, I wouldn't always gray. Right. Um, and I would oftentimes see, you know, a two to three hundred dollar difference in value in a group of 40 fat cattle between what the upper end brought and the lower end brought. And, and, and this is one reason why. This is one reason why. The other point I always like to make, we're, we're talking about transaction level now between the feedlot and the packing plant, right? Okay, that can be done on a live basis or a grid basis. You do understand though at the packing level, when they're truly selling boxed beef, that all boxed beef is sold according to quality, right? Okay, so eventually, eventually quality matters. It's just a matter of who bears that, okay? Um, a little bit more on grids what I want to talk about. So first of all, who's heard the term choice select price spread? Most everybody's heard that term. Okay? Now typically when that term is used, it's being used to describe box beef. The difference in choice box beef and select box beef. Okay? But you understand on a grid, this can be thought of too as your choice select price spread. Okay? Give me a simple, a simple one sentence explanation of what the choice select price spread is. It's the difference in what? It's the difference in what a carcass grading choice and select sell. Okay? Another way to think about it is it's the way the market rewards quality or discounts, however you look at it, right? Does that make sense? Okay? So if, if we're in a situation where, where slaughter weights are low and there's not a lot of choice cattle on the market and the market wants more choice cattle, they want to encourage feedlots to feed cattle longer, what's going to tend to happen to that choice select price spread? It's going to tend to widen, right? We're going to make that select discount deeper to encourage more feeding. Does that make sense? Now, at the same time, I don't hear near, near as many folks talk about that choice select spread and the yield grade four discount. But they're related, right? If you think about quality grades, as we feed cattle longer and they get bigger, what should happen to quality grades? Should it go up or down? It should go up, right? Okay? They should be putting on more fat and hopefully a portion of that's going tomorrow. But at the same time, as we put more and more feed to them and they're on feed longer and they get fatter, what did Dare tell us was going to happen to yield grades? They're going to become less desirable. Okay? Less desirable. 
So I always kind of like, as much as, as, as important as I think the choice select spread is, I also like to keep an eye on that yield rate for discount because those two things send a message. Okay? So right now we've got a, 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 a choice select spread of around seven bucks on this grid. I've got a yield rate for discount of around $11. So that yield rate for discount is actually steeper right now than the choice select spread. Okay? What if I had a choice, and we've seen this by the way, what if I had a choice select spread of about three bucks and I had a yield grade four discount of 15? What's the market telling us there? It's saying we don't need you to feed them as hard. We want cattle sooner. Does that make sense? We're going to hit you harder on yield grade than reward you on quality grade. So those two things are important. Um, uh, Darren mentioned other premium CAB is a big one. Uh, sterling silver applies to everything except the black eye. Or the, the, there's a lot of those out there that get you a bit more premium. And, and, and one of the more common ones is upper two-thirds of choice. Okay, so the choice grade is broken into really three categories. Okay, I can't even name them anymore. It's been too long. Okay, so well, it's just high small, high moderate, high. modest, right? But right. yeah, but but average choice and upper choice are going to be the two that get premiums. Um, You'll see discounts for heavy carcasses. You'll see discounts for age. You'll see dark cutters, things like that. Okay. Anything else or any questions? Why do we still have discounts for age? Now, everybody's been saying that this is dead, all right? But why do we still have discounts for age? There were two reasons why age was important, okay? The first one that everybody talked about was the export markets, right? Okay, Japan and Korea wanted cattle that were of a certain age. Okay, what a lot of people forget about though, what did we change as soon as we found our first BSE case? What do we have, huh? Age. Okay, yeah, and, and what, what do packing plants have to do different if an animal is deemed to be over 30 months of age? Back on now. There you go. Okay, so they have to be handled differently. So it's not as big a deal as it was when it was the exports that were the driver, but it still does matter. And there's still a discount for uh, cattle that, uh, that, are, that are graded above that 30-month age. There's, there's a, another one, too. Yep. And, and, and based on if you guys notice, maturity factors on that chart, if they go over a certain age, because age also impacts tenderness. Sure, sure. Uh, and fairly significantly. Um, and so even though there's only that one break for age to take it to the different quality grades, actually those 20-month cattle and those 14-month cattle, there's a difference in, oh, sure, sure. in tenderness, even though there's not a discount. And remind me, because I forget, the, the, difference between, the difference between A and B and B and C, do you remember what it is? 20 months is it 20 between and 20 A months? and B, but I don't know what it is between B and C. Uh, 36 months? I think it's 30, 36. That may be right. So, 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 so,
what do you suppose the Lord's lean beef's grid looks like? It's going to tend to reward what? Leanness, right? And, and more focus on yield grade. Okay? I've also seen grids where the base was not choice, the base was select, but the base was a select yield grade too. All that means is that company is targeting cattle based more on more based more on quantity and more on yield than on quality. Okay? So yields can change. Last question. You manage a feed yard, you already got a group of cattle. You don't know the first thing about it. You've never bought them. You had never fed these kind of cattle before. You don't know how they're going to do. You don't have a clue. You're going to grab them or you're going to sell them on a live weight basis? Why live weight? Somebody else has <laughs> Fair enough. Okay. So you want to shift the risk to the packer. I agree. Okay. And again, if you look at, the, if you look at the, the grid I put together, this is not all that atypical at all. This is fairly typical. Okay. First of all, you should notice there's a whole lot more red numbers and black numbers, right? And what's true about the size of the red numbers and the black numbers? Red numbers are much the red ones tend to be bigger. Okay? So there's a little bit more to lose if I don't know much about those cattle than there is to gain. On the same note, if I know about my cattle, if I know them, you can see how there, there's some pretty enticing premiums here that might Questions for me before I sit down? Yeah. Why haven't they got a program to bring this all the way back to the cow calf producer? Well, I take mine from calf to finish. You do? And my cows that typically produce a good carcass typically produce a good carcass. Sure. It's genetics. So how do you sell your fed cattle then? I sell my freedom. Oh, I got you. So you, you're kind of doing that if you think about it, right? Yeah, that's, yeah. I, that's, yeah. that's, that's, that's a... That's a Some for calling cattle buys. I mean, it gives you a whole different look when you look at your own cow with their hide pulled off. Absolutely. And sometimes we'll do programs on retained ownership. And one of the points that we oftentimes make is, you know, there's, it's not just about making money through retained ownership, right? What's the other big advantage that we say? You will truly learn the quality of the cattle that you have. If you think about our system where the majority of cattle that we sell go to be fed somewhere else and we never really find out how well they do, right? Now, people downstream know, by the way, right? We just don't, okay? You know, we have a system that makes it hard to get that information flow back the other way and it does make it hard to make management decisions, I agree. And, and you know, one advantage of having freezer beef to sell is you do get a feel for quality on a much different level than you would otherwise, okay? Same thing with retained ownership, okay? You'll actually see how well your cattle do in a feed yard setting, and you can actually see how well they grade. It can be very eye-opening, very eye-opening. Okay? And getting rid of some of the bottom end is oftentimes the best thing you can do to improve the quality of your it's, it's not so much the top. It's getting rid of the bottom that makes a big difference usually. Anything else? Good thought, good question. Anything else? All right.